Okay. Well, well, well. All right, we got a, a few people here. Um, it looks like it's probably a good time to get started uh normally we got light attendance on fridays so we might as well get going um i'm going to start this off with a little bit about the inverse function theorem some people were asking about i believe it's a uh, problem three on your homework uh trying to figure out what's going on there so um seemed like a reasonable idea to just go through that quick uh the idea is this um so I'll just I'll just uh, bring it up really quick. Um, let me just pop that up on the screen here. All right, problem number th three is that right? No, it's is it two or three? Well, here we'll do we'll talk a little bit about two real quick. Um, all right, here. So let's bring this guy on over. All right, so we were, uh, th this one um, helps you to derive the uh, inverse function theorem, or at least the formula in the inverse function theorem via the chain rule. So the, the gist of it is this. Um, we'll just take f inverse of f of z, which is equal to z, we're going to use the chain rule and we're going to differentiate this. So assuming that um, F inverse is defined and is analytic, this is totally reasonable. Um, the real meat of proving the inverse function theorem is showing that F inverse is indeed defined and is analytic. This is the last little end part that gives you a nice formula. So the thing we're trying to show is that DF inverse DW is equal to one over f prime of z where w is equal to f of z so this is just uh f of you can think about this is like f inverse of w right here right because w is f of z so we just want to ddw both sides if you want to think of it like that right so let's just uh we'll, we'll rewrite it like that All right, so we'll just uh, really quick do this. We'll just DDZ both sides, how about? Okay, it's pretty obvious what happens on the right-hand side. That just turns into a one. On the other side, we're just gonna do a chain rule. Uh, we'll write this as DF inverse dw dw dz right okay and hey wouldn't you know it dw dz well what is w w is just f of z so that's uh df dz and if we bring this on over this is one over um we'll write it as df dz but as we wrote it originally in the statement it's a uh, f prime of z and so bada bang there we go um nice all right fair enough easy easy idea right there it's not a fancy trick i know i just did uh one of the things on your homework but the idea now is to use um in problem number three which i think is probably where i'm guessing people are experiencing the real uh issues um I'm just uh, going to change that real quick. We're going to use this nice uh this idea we just got to right here. 
Um, and we're going to use the inverse function theorem to show that if f from uh, a to c, where a is some, uh, you know, uh, nice region, um, is analytic, and f prime of z is not equal to zero for all z in a, then f maps open sets in a to open sets. So what we want to show is that uh, f of o is open in c whenever o is open in a. And remember, a carries the uh, subspace topology of c. So the gist of doing all of this is just that when f prime of z is non-zero, well, we can use the inverse function theorem and we can uh, show that near any given point, f has an inverse defined near that point, right? This inverse is continuous, right? And f of f, or f inverse of, you can write it either way, you can write it as f inverse of f of uh, z is equal to z. And this is where some of the, uh, the confusing, confusing notation might happen, right? Um, namely, because we write the inverse function and the preimage using the same notation, um, it can be a little bit weird. Um, but basically, if we want to just, uh, instead of writing f inverse, if we say wrote like g instead, right? So we can write preimages nicely. Then uh, notice that if you put in for um, z, some open set or something like that, uh, you would have g, which is just what we're using to write f inverse of f of o or something is equal to o. Okay, can we use continuity and take a preimage or something like that and get to a result about f of o um, being open? Something to that effect, right? Like the preimage of a open set is open for a continuous function, right? So that's kind of the uh, the idea right there. If you can, I think I think you can see. It. I don't want to give every step of it away, but that's the uh, that's the way we're using the inverse function theorem is just to get the existence of uh, this guy, this 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 uh, G as we're calling it. So that's just a little piece right there about the homework. Now we can get into uh, the real business of the day, which is, and let me hide those ones. Um, which is section 1.6, differentiating the elementary functions. This is a real nice and quick section. Um, so we'll go through it pretty fast. Um, if anyone else has any questions about homework stuff, please do feel free to send that to me before class so um, I can run through it in class. We can also do office hours. There's no uh, big problem either way. Um, but anyways, jumping into differentiating the elementary functions. Let me get this nice and zoomed on in so we have plenty of room and we can see everything nicely. Um, all right. So we're going to start out um, with Proposition 1.6.1, and this is exactly the kind of thing we're going to do in the entire section. In the last section, we found out that, hey, the complex derivative works um, pretty similarly to the real derivative. In fact, in all of the important ways that we care about, um, in the last section at least, it worked the same way. We got all of the nice things we were used to. Um, we, al we also got additional things like the Cauchy-Riemann equations and uh, some of these strong constraints about how um, holomorphic or analytic functions have to uh, behave. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to start to talk about some of the elementary functions, some things a little bit more complicated than the polynomials we dealt with previously and a little bit less um, abstract and more concrete than some of the general like let f be analytic, right? we'll actually talk about specific analytic maps, some of the ones we tend to use a lot. For example, uh, the map f given by z maps to e to the z. That is the exponential map. This map is analytic on c, all of c, and satisfies well exactly what we want. The uh, derivative 
with respect to z of e to the z is just e to the z. How about that? That's a, that's a pretty smooth move. Okay, let's prove this real quick because we should see a few of these proofs. We should actually do some proofs here and there. It's a math class after all. Um, just recall really quickly, just from definition, f of z, which is e to the z, this will be e to the x uh, cosine y plus i sine y where z is equal to x plus i sine or x plus i y all right both uh the real and imaginary parts of f of z if you'll notice are differentiable uh infinitely many times in the real variable sense so f is differentiable in the sense of real variables and to show that it's differentiable in the sense of complex variables we just have to show that it satisfies the uh, cauchy riemann equations remember this was the cauchy riemann theorem that we did in the last section um, nice um, continuous derivatives uh, in the real sense that exist and the cauchy riemann equations gives us analyticity um, so all we have to do is you just go through and calculate all of the partials so let's really quickly break this up into our u and our v piece we'll have e to the x cosine y plus uh, sine, or here, let me write it like this. I'll keep everything in order. e to the x sine y i. Uh, this is the uh, u portion right here, and this is v. Let's do a little bit of differentiation. Uh, partial u, partial x. Well, this is just going to be uh, e to the x cosine y, right? Okay, partial v, partial x. Um, or actually, let's write it like this. Let's do partial u, uh, partial y right now then. Well, what's the uh, derivative of cosine of y? It'll be sine, uh, minus sine of y, right? E minus e to the x, sine y, and then partial u, er, geez, look at me. Partial v, partial x is going to be, well, e to the x sine y, and then partial u partial y is, or I keep writing u's when I keep meaning to write v's. Why did we always, why do we choose such similar letters here? Um, this is a good question that we should ask ourselves more frequently. It is e to the x cosine y. And so, hey, would you look at that? Um, since partial u, partial x equals partial v, partial y, and partial u, partial y is negative partial v, partial x. Um, the cauchy riemann equations hold. OK, so um, both of these guys right here, let me just add this little note right here. I'll say real C infinity, right? Infinitely continuously differentiable in the real sense. Okay, so we have real C infinity and Cauchy Riemann. So by the Cauchy Riemann, Theorem, F is analytic. Uh, I'm still not spelling right great right now. And if you recall, we had a nice formula. Um, DF, DZ. We could write it in two different ways. We could write it as uh, partial U, partial X, plus I, partial V, partial X something like that. That was one reasonable way. We could also do uh, partial u, partial y, um, I believe plus one over i, partial uh, v, um, partial y, right? Yeah. Um, either way, we could write with respect to the uh, either variables, just with respect to differentiating partials of one variable because we have this nice relationship between the two. Uh, you can flip back and forth very easily. And so next thing you know, 
we can actually just plug it on in there and we can uh um right that is e to the z is analytic and d e to the z dz is equal to well partial u partial x what did we have there it was e to the x cosine of y and then partial uh, v partial x is e to the x sine y oh wait a second that was just u and v yet again right so that's just gonna be e to the z okay done good enough all right so we got a nice uh, little proof right there doing my little proof box um little definition here a function uh, like e to the z that is analytic or holomorphic on C on all of C is called entire I don't know why I did that with a capital E uh, so we would say something like uh, the exponential map is an entire function so an entire function, uh, if it's differentiable on the entirety of C, as opposed to on some subset. All right, cool. Um, naturally, of course, this lets us do lots of uh, different cool derivatives um, using uh, chain rule, product rule, etc. We can now differentiate in the complex sense all sorts of different things. You guys have all taken calculus, so you understand. Uh, the implications of that um, and it would make sense now to get on to the logarithm the uh, inverse function remember the logarithm is only a uh, locally defined inverse of um, the exponential because the exponential is now periodic uh, and thus um, non-injective uh, globally just injective locally um, and Accordingly, we have to pick branches of the logarithm um, because of this periodicity. So uh, this is important to think about when you're talking about differentiability or analyticity of the uh, logarithm in the complex plane because we do have a, a caveat that there is not just one logarithm. That is, relative to each branch, we will get different regions of analyticity and different derivatives and different values and so on. Um, the important thing to remember here is that this just comes from our choice of arg z, right? Um, log z was the log of the uh, modulus of z, that's the regular old logarithm, so nothing weird there, plus i arg z, where arg z, um, must lie in some, uh, oh, two pi thick strip, right? X plus i y where y is between y naught and uh, y naught plus 2 pi, right? So we have lots of different uh, branches we can choose. Um, one that people like to use, um, that people call the principal branch of the logarithm, is the one that includes uh, the argument of 0. Um, so from minus pi to pi, right? That way we don't have to uh, jump over the real axis. Um, that is, uh, if we use some of the other ones, right? Like let's say we go from uh, zero up to two pi, then every time we jump over the positive real axis, um, our log function jumps by two pi. Uh, so we wouldn't even have continuity and therefore we definitely can't have complex differentiability. Um, so sometimes people like to use this one because then you at least have the positive real axis in the region of analyticity. But we should, um, we should be excessively clear here that uh, this is this is their relative to uh, each branch is what we're doing our differentiating. So there is a uh, this big uh, caveat when we talk about logarithms that I will keep trying to hammer home and hopefully eventually everyone will feel comfortable with it and I won't have to say it quite as much. But every time we deal with the logarithm, we are dealing with a family of different functions that we can define based on
the values we have argz take. Um, so this is a nice uh, fun application using the inverse function theorem. Let's actually prove this. So we're gonna let uh, A be the open set in C. That's uh, everything sans the negative real axis, including zero. Um, then we'll define a branch of log on there um, according to this right here. Log Z is uh, the regular definition of it, but the arg is between minus pi and pi. That's the principal branch. Um, what we're claiming is that log Z is analytic on this set A with ddz of log z given by 1 over z, the usual derivative of the logarithm that we are all familiar with. Um, and analogous statements would obviously hold for other branches. Um, okay, how do we go through and do we do this? Well, let's write it on out. So, we know log z is the, and I will be clear here, I will say the unique inverse of the exponential restricted to z such that um, we'll write it like this, uh, mz less than pi restricted uh, to this this strip right so relative to this little strip where we're doing everything right then um, we have a unique inverse that's kind of the entire point of you know defining all of these different logs just that e to the z becomes periodic because it's defined in terms of sines and cosines which are periodic and so we have to um, do everything on each little domain like this Okay, then um, we'll use the inverse function theorem. All right, so since we just did this, d e to the z, d z is equal to e to the z, and e to the z is never equal to zero. Uh, the inverse function theorem says that e to the z has an analytic uh, local inverse. OK. Since the inverse is unique, it must be log z. Ah, okay. Hence, using the formula we started the class by doing, because we knew it would come up again, um, we have that d dz of log z is going to be 1 over f prime of z. Um, f prime of z is f of z, right? Which is just our w. Well, I guess I should write it like this. Let me write it in the exact same way we wrote it at the beginning of class to make it super clear. Um, we knew, so we wrote df inverse dw, right? Is 1 over uh, df uh, dz, right? Okay, so this is just saying... Um, this is just, I'll write it like this, uh, so if f of z is e to the z, uh, f inverse of z, or we can write this as f inverse of w if you would like, is, um, log z, and since df dz in this, the derivative here is e to the z, and w is just e to the z, right? I'll write that even here like this. This is the same setup we were doing right at the beginning kind of thing, right? W is f of z. In this case, it's e to the z, right? Okay, then what this statement right here becomes is that 
f inverse prime of w is given by, well, what is f prime of z? It's still f of z. So it's 1 over w. Replace all these w's with z's, and we get our result. You get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Hopefully so. We don't have uh, enough people in the chat to tell me if it doesn't. Um, and so we can do this for each point w in uh, our set. Um, and naturally, we get what we want. All right. Does that make some sense? So if we've shown that it's analytic near every point, uh, since uh, you know analyticity, differentiability is a local property, um, you do it at every point. We've shown that it has a uh, nice, well-defined derivative at every point. It's given in terms of the derivative of e to the z, and um, since it has that in every point that we that that is uh, compatible with um, this branch choice right here, you get what you want. Uh, naturally, of course, the same thing holds for different branches. Nothing particularly weird going on there. It's just that you have to do this again on separate regions with a different function. Does that make sense? Um, just like you can have multiple functions have the uh, same derivative, they just are uh, they just vary by uh, constants, right? You can essentially have the same kind of a statement hold here. I won't make that statement exactly because that's not exactly the same. Uh, situation to some extent um, because you know we have to once again deal with we, or whether it's the same statement or not is something that we would have to show because we have to deal with the uh, different directions of approach and so on so I won't just glibly make that a uh, statement um, what I'll try to point out is just that the uh, differences in our branch right here are just we're just adding two pi right so it makes sense that when we change our function just by changing the output of arg z, you know, adding or subtracting 2 pi, right? Um, constants, you know, moving it around, shifting it. Um, if we're just shifting things about, then we shouldn't be changing our derivative and we'll get the same thing every time. Um, however, this is for a family of functions relative to each choice every uh, for what uh, values arg should take. We get a different branch. And then we get a region of analyticity for that branch. And um, we've calculated what the derivative is relative to any choice of branches. It's going to be 1 over z, just like this. But um, yeah, it's the, the trick right there. There's another proof you can do involving um, using the polar form of the cauchy riemann equations. I don't really feel like that is uh, super worth our while at this, uh, at this present juncture. Um, however, um, it is, it is, uh, important to think about, um, and I just want to put a picture here, actually. It is always important to think about which, uh, branch of the logarithm you are choosing. Um, so just let's give ourselves like a little picture here. Let's move over a little bit, or actually even I'll just resize this bad boy. I got it a little bit too big. Okay, so this is the domain of the principal branch. Just think about that. Um, they're drawing it kind of goofy right here, but basically it's everything except for that uh, negative real axis, including zero. Um, this is the domain of log z, and we have to be very careful um, relative to whatever choice of branch we're doing. Um, when we're doing compositions and using chain rules and all that stuff, just because, um, and especially when we're doing manipulations involving log, just because uh, while it may be true that like log z squared is equal to 2 log z for uh, different branches, um, it, you know, it matters which branch you're dealing with in each of those statements, right? And so when we're doing these um, derivatives, we need to be careful there. So the kind of uh, deal with this is that you have to make sure that you're not picking up certain things that will mess you up. They go through this really well in your book and talk about it um, and do a, a well-worked-out little piece. I think, I think we, have, we have time to do this. Um, I think this is not something that I will be grilling you on um, and trying to trick you with. 
but it is important to know. Uh, so let's just kind of run through the idea. Um, here, let me, let me pull up another picture actually. Okay, so let's look at, um, let's call this f of z uh, is uh, log z squared. And we'll say that g of z is uh, 2 log z. Um, now, if we consider all the possible values of the logarithms, then the two collections of values we would get are the same. However, if we pick a particular branch, for example, let's take the principal branch and use it for both f and g then we will not necessarily get the same thing. So um, let's uh, look at f of, say, uh, minus 1 plus i. If we look at f of minus 1 plus i, then, um, well, in this case, then arg z, well, let's, let's calculate it out. We're going to have this is going to be the log of, uh, well, what is minus 1 plus i squared? If you actually, we should just write that out very quickly. Um, so that'll be 1 minus 2i uh, plus i squared. Right, so that's a minus 1. So this and that guy will cancel. That's minus 2i, right? And uh, so that will be... Um, So the uh, arg, what I'm trying to say right here is that arg of uh, minus 2i in the uh, principal branch, right, is uh, 3 pi over 4, right? 3 pi over 4, yeah. All right, and then, um, did, I, did I do that wrong? Oh my god, I did that wrong. I wrote that okay sorry this is i'm being i'm being silly right here and i made a bad mistake it's not three pi over four i was looking at the wrong piece sorry and writing too quickly um arg of minus two i should be uh so just think about where we're going we're going um wow look at me what a fool i am it's pi o minus pi over two right okay yeah because minus two i is just going to be directly down right so if we're like going like this it should just be like right over here right minus 2i okay perfect minus pi over 2 sorry um on the other hand uh if we're looking at like sorry i'm writing sideways now and making a big old mess of things uh g of minus 1 plus i um this is going to be 2 uh log of minus 1 plus i and I'll just tell you right now that minus 1 plus i has a arg of something uh, a little bit different, which in the uh, principal branch, this is where I messed up. This is going to be 3 pi over 4, obviously. <laughs> um, Okay, and so if we just, you know, end up going by 2 right here, uh, what do we end up getting? Well, we just take the modulus of this and we do this. Um, I'll just actually write out what we get. I think I'm kind of shoving this all into the corner. But what I'm trying to point out is that the args are different, and so when we go through and we actually do this, this 2 will not be enough to fix things. So the log of minus 2i, um, this is the, the squared case. This is log... Uh, 2 minus, um, I'll write this as pi over 2i, right? While in the arg of uh, minus 1 plus i, and I am writing at a ridiculous angle right here. Let me just put this right up here. Um, no, nah, whatever. Okay, this guy is, uh, sorry for writing at this angle. Let me, let me actually move that. That's going to be awful to look at here. Mm. 
well, I've uh, certainly gotten myself into a pickle here with my with my writing. Um, apologies for that. All right. Anyways, so I'm gonna erase the that right there, and now we can get back to what we were doing. Um, this guy ends up being uh, two times the modulus of this, um, and we'll just end up getting log two plus uh, three pi over two uh, i, right? Because we multiply by two. Um, and so there you go, you end up getting this and notice once again, um, while the values of these guys are uh, different, one of them we get uh, log two plus three pi over two i, while the other one we get log two minus pi over two i. Notice add uh, two pi to pi minus pi over two and we get three pi over two, right? So these guys are just shifted um, in terms of what you get, right? They're shifted by two pi. Uh, correspondingly, their derivatives should be the same, right? We're just moving them up or down a little bit, right? But we should be careful that they don't necessarily have the same values. And so when you're going through and you're computing things like chain rule, you should uh, be cautious um, about which statements you're making. Uh, I will not try to trick you on this, but you should always be um, careful that you are being mindful of which branch you're using. Um, anyways, that potentially very confusing diversion aside, um, let us get back to def uh, deriving some of the more some more elementary functions that we all know and love. Uh, for example, the sine and the cosine functions, uh, proposition one point six point three. Um, these guys, we're going to claim sine and cosine are entire and they have the derivatives you would expect. So how do you get this? Um, just here's the proof. Um, and I'll write it as a, this is a sketch. So we'll note that, and this is the, uh, the important piece, right? Uh, so we'll say, DDZ of sine Z is going to be, well, DDZ of, well, what is sine Z? It's E to the uh, IZ minus E to the minus IZ uh, over 2I, right? And so I just differentiate each of these guys. Um, and we're, I'm going to write out what the same thing is for cosine. Uh, of z, and I'm just going to do these kind of simultaneously. You'll see this uh, very quickly. For cosine, we obviously have the um, e to the i z plus e to the minus i z over 2, right? Okay, so all we have to do is just actually go through and differentiate. Notice you can pull out these uh, uh, one over twos or one over i's, right? And so on. And uh, remember one over i, what is that? Well, all you have to do is multiply by a conjugate, right? So you get minus i. And so minus i um, is all that's gonna come out there, but notice that when you differentiate, this minus i is gonna come on down from the e. And so then you end up getting the formula for cosine. Um, more specifically, if you want to actually see that one, uh, all you get, just differentiate the e to the iz. Well, you get e to the iz, differentiate uh, minus e to the minus iz. You get uh, plus i e to the minus iz. It's all over to uh, i. Oh, sorry, I forgot to bring down the i right there. Differentiate e to the iz. You get i e to the iz. And so, bam, bam, bam e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over 2. Hey, that's what cosine is. When you do the cosine one, would you believe it? You'll just go through and you'll get uh, i e to the iz um, minus i e to the uh, minus iz over 2. And let's just pull out a uh, minus i from each. And then we can put that on the bottom and it becomes, you know, one over I, right? Because minus I is equal to one over I, right? 
So we'll pull out a minus i, and we'll get e to the, uh, uh, or did I mess up like a minus sign somewhere? Let me make sure I got that right. Uh, I'll just pull out an i right there. An i over 2. Um, did I miss an i right there? i over 2. Oh, I mean, if, here's what the manipulation is. Sorry, it's a dumb manipulation right here. Uh, so I over 2 is definitely equal to uh, minus 1 over 2i, right? So, sorry, just think about that. I over 2 equals uh, minus 1 over 2i. If you don't notice that, we can just go I over, uh, or do minus I over i. And hey, multiply them on the bottom, multiply them on the top, you get a minus i, or you get an i up top. On the bottom, you'll get an i squared, but a minus, so that's just a 1, right? Okay, so that's all we have to do, is we pull out a minus 1 over 2i, and then we get back what we want for uh, minus sine z, right? And I'm going to make sure that I, yeah, okay, it has the minus, good. Um, and there you go, minus sine z, perfect. Um, and so that's the, the whole trick. That's the very sketched out proof. Nothing too fancy. And amazingly, we are already uh, very nearly done with this entire section. Um, this is a shockingly short section. All that's left is uh, Proposition 1.6.4, which uh, we can book through pretty quick. So let's just do that right now really fast. Um, so this, we'll talk about the power function, the function that sends z to a to the z. Um, so a to the z for some fixed uh, a, right? Some fixed complex number a. Um, and this guy, we're going to claim that for any branch of the log function, the function that maps z to a to the z is entire, and it has a derivative of uh, log a a to the z. This is, once again, like in the real case. Um, and then for any branch of the log function, uh, for example, the principal branch, the function that maps z to z to the b is analytic on the domain of the branch of the log chosen, and the derivative is uh, b z to the b minus 1. So let's just write the actual proofs out. Um, hopefully these are readable. So just note that uh, I'll, I'll kind of kind of rewrite a bit of it if it looks sort of hard to see. a to the z is uh, e z log a, right? E z log a, right? This is just that good old trick. Um, when you use the chain rule, obviously this is analytic um, on c. It's nice. Um, and then you get the derivative uh, just using the chain rule yet again. Um, why is this analytic, you might say, uh, on all of c? Why is this entire? You might be like, oh, there's a log. This is bad, but notice a is fixed here. z is the variable. So this is just log a. That's just a number, right? e to the z log a. Ah, all good. Okay, so it's analytic. Um, and you just, you know, choose your branch of log, and then you get an actual value right there. Once again, this actually does matter if you, when you choose a branch of log, because uh, this will change what you get out for the derivative here, right? Um, so relative to your choice of a branch of log, you have to do that. Um, and then you get your derivative out um, and log a, e to the z log a. Bam. Nice. Okay, and then uh, it's just an application of chain rule. Um, if you feel worried about that, I would encourage you to uh, do that as an exercise. It's not uh, not too bad. Then um, part two, when we're looking at the function z maps to z to the b, that is taking beef powers of things. We just do the exact same trick again, but now we have z to the b is e to the b log z instead of before a to the z is e to the z log a, right? Okay, and this function will be uh, analytic on the domain of log z. It's a composition of an entire function with a function that is analytic on its, well, the domain of analyticity. Um, so that's going to be the domain of analyticity for log z.
um, on the domain of log z, uh, you just do this chain rule, right? D, D, Z of Z to the B. And you go through and you go, okay, I got E to the B log Z. Well, I'm going to take the derivative of the inside function B log Z. I'll get B over Z. And then uh, derivative of the outside function E to the Z with the inside function plugged in. Well, I'll just get the same thing yet again. And so I have B to the Z, E to the B log Z. But hey, that's just Z to the B. And so I have B over Z, Z to the B. And uh, this is just B times Z to the B minus 1 which is what we claimed right here. All right, fair enough. Notice this number two one right here, z maps to z to the b, um, is enough to give us the derivative of the square root function, right? Because you could take b to b one half, right? Uh, or the nth root. And this is proposition 1.6.5. The function z maps to z to the one over n, it's the nth root of z. This will be analytic on the domain of log z that you choose, for example, the principal branch, and has the derivative uh, exactly what you expect, 1 over n, z to the 1 over n minus 1. Exactly like in regular old calculus. Uh, we don't even need to prove that because it just followed from the proof of what we just had right down here. And would you know it, that's uh, actually all of the new content in... Uh, section 1.6 and we've now finished our first chapter of this textbook and it is uh, exactly time to end class and it's Friday so let's just call it have an awesome weekend I'll see you on Monday oh by the way homework is uh, now due on Monday some students requested it so extra day um, all good with me cool uh, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email. I am around this weekend, and I'm here to help. And, uh, yeah, otherwise, have an uh, awesome night. Why is my mouse doing this? What is going on here? I don't know why I'm still streaming. My computer is totally frozen. So this is kind of ruining the, the sign out there. What is going on? All right, OBS Studio has now crashed my computer. What is happening? Okay, I think I I think I got it. Have